Good afternoon. Um, my topic is uh, uh, a bit special um, because it concerns um, um, a part of um, the model code which is like a code within a code. Um, normally, well, okay, that's, normally um, seismic codes are separate codes. And um, in the past, um, uh, in model code 1978, uh, there was no seismic uh, design. Uh, but uh, the mo that model code was followed by so-called seismic annex, um, which was published in 1985. And um, that was uh, an extension of model code 1978 to cover seismic design. Um, that um, um, document was very important because it formed the basis of um, the first version, the ENV version, the pre-standard version of your code date, in the same way as um, the CBFIP model codes, both of 1978 and of 1990, formed the basis not only of Euro code 2, but of EN 1990, base of design. Everything was based on the FIB model codes. So this tradition was broken, let's say, with the absence of um, uh, seismic design uh, from model code 1990 and uh, uh, the lack of a follow-up in that direction. So uh, when the European standard EN, uh, uh, 90, uh, EN 1998, the Eurocode date was developed, it was developed partly on the basis of the ENV, which was based on the uh, CEB seismic uh, co design code, but also partly independently. And now that um, the uh, revision of all the Eurocodes, including the Eurocode date, is coming up, there should be a, another basis for uh, the Euro, for Eurocode date. Uh, in the same way that uh, model code 2010 will form the basis for the revision of Eurocode 2. So uh, the uh, ambition was to provide such a basis within uh, model code 2010. So uh, um, scattered uh, around uh, model code 2010, um, there are um, um, various parts which refer exclusively to seismic design. And if you put everything together, you end up with a, a, a code, a seismic design code, uh, which is operational for buildings and bridges and similar structures. So the ambition is to cover in a uniform way uh, various uh, types of uh, concrete structures. Uh, it is, um, uh, let's say, a world premiere that it is a full-fledged uh, performance-based and, and displacement-based uh, de seismic design code for new structures. Um, and it applies um, also not only to new designs, but to assessment of existing structures. And as a matter of fact, it, has be, it follows the footsteps of um, uh, American and European standards for existing structures. ASCE uh, uh, standard 41, which is on rehabilitation uh, uh, of uh, existing structures, is fully performance and, and displacement based. And the same applies to Eurocode 8 part 3, which ag ag again refers to existing buildings. So model code 2010 turned somehow those uh, um, codes for existing structures on their head and made them, made them uh, extended them to um, to, new new, for, to new designs of new structures. However, although I said that it is an operational code, it does not cover many aspects which normally are covered in seismic codes, uh, and namely those which are not specific to concrete. For example, seismic codes have um, uh, uh, whole chapters on uh, seismic isolation and uh, energy dissipation, or other aspects uh, to minimize damage to non-structural elements. These are not uh, present here because they don't refer to, spe to specific structures, to, to concrete structures. But whatever is needed to apply uh, model code 2010 for concrete structures, that is the description of the seismic action, is there. So this is the definition of the scope. 
Um, I said that it is, um, for the first time, a fully performance-based and, and displacement-based. What does uh, performance-based mean? Uh, seismic design codes to the present day have been uh, focusing on the means, not the, on the ends. The ends are performance. The means are uh, how you achieve this performance, and, uh, and uh, these are normally uh, the force reduction factor, what in Europe is called behavior factor, by which one divides the uh, linear elastic um, uh, um, seismic response spectrum to convert into the design spectrum, the detailing rules, etc. So these uh, means are 99% uh, arbitrary. Uh, they are not chosen normally on the, on the basis of uh, um, uh, some uh, rational, um, uh, say, derivation. Uh, and uh, uh, nobody knows what exactly uh, they achieve and what the, how they come, where they come from. W with performance-based design, uh, the designer, uh, the code explicitly defines targets. And the designer knows what uh, he or she achieves by pursuing those targets. Uh, of course, design it becomes more complicated, more demanding. But um, uh, the outcome overall is uh, not only more rational, but also more co cost efficient. Now, um, the, uh, in seismic design, somehow performance-based design was, uh, appears as, as if it has been discovered in the uh, 1990s in the United States. But um, in Europe, um, it was in a... Performance-based design was uh, there since the 1960s to 1970s in the form of limit state design. It's, uh, performance levels and limit states are the same thing. Um, it's just a terminology. And in, uh, in Europe, uh, in the 60s, uh, there are two types of uh, limit states defined, ultimate limit states and serviceability limit state. But uh, the um, uh, CB documents, even in the uh, 70s, we're talking about intermediate damage limit states between ultimate sensibility. So this is essentially performance-based uh, performance design. So the definition of, uh, performance of limit states in, uh, the, in, the, in the model code is, uh, again, the traditional one, serviceability limit states and um, ultimate limit states. But for seismic design, Instead of having a single serviceability limit state, there are two introduced. One is called operational, in which uh, the structure essentially is required to remain elastic and not be affected at all by the earthquake itself. And uh, another one called immediate use, uh, which uh, 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 allows uh, some um, uh, minor damage, which uh, is not worth even repairing. And, uh, uh, after cleanup and uh, possibly uh, uh, reinstatement of um, uh, lifelines uh, and no, in, uh, of normal operation of uh, lifelines, uh, the facility can go back to full uh, use, either occupancy or use if it is a bridge. Um, and uh, uh, concerning ultimate limit states, there is the general definition of ultimate limit states in the model code. Uh, in the sense that um, they have to do with um, um, life, life safety or uh, property protection, and they are somehow related to full or partial collapse. And um, in um, uh, seismic design, um, they are uh, further, um, say, um, subdivided into um, uh, life safety and uh, collapse, in the sense of um, having uh, higher or medium uh, consequences um, as uh, normally provided in, uh, every co in every code. So the uh, ultimate limit states, as I said, are these two, life safety and near collapse. Um, I will come back uh, to the, what uh, each one of those um, means. Um, essentially, life safety um, and, uh, entail significant um, uh, damage, but um, uh, little uh, reduction in, in uh, stiffness and uh, resistance so that the structure can uh, sustain safely aftershocks. Um, so it is not safe for normal use, 
but um, it can be repaired. Technically, it is feasible to repair it, and most, most likely it is economically repairable. Uh, sometimes it may not be. Uh, while at the near collapse limit state, the, the structure is at the verge of collapse. It is uh, unsafe uh, even for emergency use, uh, especially during the aftershock activity. So it, su it still supports the gravity laws, but it may collapse um, due to an, an, another earthquake um, in an aftershock activity. So, uh, and uh, um, the, the structure that reaches the near collapse limit state may be not be able to be salvaged. It may have to be demolished. Now, for each one of those, um, a different seismic action is associated. For the operational limit state, uh, the model code says that one associates a, a, a seismic action which, is, which most likely will happen during the lifetime of the structure. It's a frequent seismic action. Uh, I will come back to numbers uh, shortly. While for the immediate use limit state, which um, uh, will cause some damage, um, we associate normally an occasional earthquake, which may or may not happen during the life of the structure. Um, on the other hand, for the life safety limit state, we normally associate a, a rare seismic action, like the one which forms the basis of all current, uh, all present day uh, design codes, uh, the 475 year uh, or approximately 500 year return period er uh, earthquake, which has a 10% probability of exceedance in 50 years. This is the norm for um, uh, codes uh, right now. Um, life safety is the only uh, limit state which is checked um, uh, for uh, in seismic design, and uh, that's the standard seismic action for that life safety limit state. And for the near collapse limit state, we are talking about a very unlikely and very rare seismic action that has a mean return period of 1,000 to 2,000 years. Now, so this is as far as the performance-based um, uh, aspect of the, of the seismic part of model code um, is concerned. Now, I said it's also displacement-based. Um, displacement based means that we use in the, the verifications displacement deformations, not forces. Because the earthquake is not a, a system of, uh, of forces imposed on the structure. It's not like wind. Uh, it's um, a ground movement which uh, essentially imposes displacements on the structure. The earthquake imposes displacement. The structure responds with forces. The, uh, the magnitude of the forces is defined by the structure. It is its resistance. So uh, it's not, uh, the earthquake is not given forces for which to, we have to design the, the structure. It is the, uh, more or less given displacement or energy input. And as a matter of fact, the structures in earthquakes collapse due to displacements which generate second order effects, second order moments in the columns if the structures had mass but no weight, they would not collapse in earthquake. It's the second order uh, moments which uh, are generated by displacements that ultimately co cause the collapse. So we are still though using force-based design. Why force-based design? Because we are used to it. Uh, gravity loads, wind loads are all force-based. Uh, force, force and another thing is that equilibrium provides a very solid basis for analysis and for calculations. If uh, an, an analysis results satisfy equilibrium, they are not very far from being uh, uh, exact, accurate. Uh, compatibility, which has to do with uh, displacements, is, is not so easy to satisfy and does not guarantee um, uh, the, let's say, good approximation. So the, the key in displacement-based design is that 
ductile uh, failure modes, namely those which have to do with flexor, are uh, uh, checked in terms of de deformations or displacements. Only brittle failure modes, that is in concrete shear, is checked in terms of forces. So we have these two types of uh, um, format, verification, uh, format for verifications. In terms of the displacements for ductile modes, in terms of um, forces for brittle. However, for the, um, also for the serviceability limit states, we use normally displacements. But if we require um, elastic response, of course, using uh, forces or displacements is equivalent. So this slide puts whatever I have said so far and, what, and a good part of what I'm going to say uh, together. It lists the four limit states provided in the Euro code, um, operational, immediate use, life safety, and near collapse. What they mean for the operation of the facility, this is the performance. Um, so the second uh, column is the performance which is targeted. The third column is what is the structural condition associated with this performance. Um, how to, the performance is translated into uh, bar yielding, concrete cracking or spalling, or uh, disintegration of concrete, uh, loss in uh, resistance uh, or strength, etc. Then the, um, the fourth column, uh, the second from the end, um, is um, how this uh, limit state is checked in terms of deformations. And at, uh, the, at the top row, which is at the end of operational uh, limit state, um, we uh, re require elastic response. At the other end, uh, at the near collapse, we allow members to reach their ultimate deformation. But to keep a certain um, safety margin, uh, we don't use uh, the mean value of the um, uh, ultimate deformation in those uh, uh, verifications, but a 5% fractile. So it's like a character lower characteristic strength that we are using, but we are using it without safety factor. Now, for life, life safety, we apply on those ultimate deformations a safety factor of 1.35. It's like multiplying them by 0.75. While for the immediate use, we um, allow um, elements, members, to reach a ductility factor of 2, go um, uh, beyond the yield uh, point by another 100% of the, of the yield displacement. And now at the, at the last uh, uh, column, you, uh, you may see listed the seismic action, which is uh, um, considered appropriate for ordinary structures, not special and high important structures, for its limit state. Uh, the frequent is, has a almost certain, um, is almost certain to take place during the lifetime. The occasional uh, is um, so and so um, for the immediate use. The rare is, as I said, uh, the one with the 500 uh, year mean return period. And the very rare for the near collapse is uh, one with thousands of years of mean return period. So these are uh, what is, uh, this is what is suggested in, um, in uh, model code uh, 2010 for these performance limits. Now, um, Note, though, that it is not compulsory to check the structure for all four performance levels. Uh, this is a model code. Uh, uh, national or regional authorities will use it as a basis. They may say that uh, uh, one uh, serviceability limit state out of the two, out of the two and one uh, ultimate limit state out of, the, out of the two should be checked but at least one of each type. So two limit states at least. Note that when we are talking about displacement-based design, under certain conditions that we will see in so soon, displacements are almost proportional to the level of the earthquake. 
So it does not make much sense to do one check under uh, an earthquake uh, um, action for exceedance of yielding and another check under an, another uh, earthquake action for ex uh, exceedance of ductility ratio of two. If the second is less than uh, the second action less than twice the first, it does not. Um, um, we don't need to check it. The same for the uh, life safety and the near collapse. So normally, two limit states are enough. Now, the each seismic action of each type is uh, um, described by the uh, elastic response spectrum for five percent damping, which gives the um, maximum um, ex uh, the maximum um, um, acceleration of a single degree of freedom system as a function of its period. Um, it does not define a shape, uh, but it says the model code says that it's not a good idea to scale this spectrum to a single parameter of the ground motion, like the peak ground acceleration. It's, um, it is desirable to define each part of it, uh, constant spectral acceleration, constant spectral ve velocity or displacement, separately, to have a uniform hazard spectrum. Now, the earthquake has three, co three components. For the two of them, the same, uh, the horizontal ones, the same spectrum applies. For the vertical, another spectrum, which also has to be defined. And these three components, the, the model code says, are taken to, to act uh, concurrently, simultaneously. Now, as we will see soon, the reference analysis method is non-linear dynamic analysis. It's the most advanced type of method for seismic, for earthquake, um, uh, for earthquake engineering, uh, in which um, you integrate step by step the equations of motion and you come up with a response. For that type of analysis, you need uh, to define um, the motion in terms of acceleration uh, time histories. Um, and um, the model code, like all the other codes, says that you need at least seven if you want to average their results, or at least three uh, acceleration time histories, or combinations of components, if you are going to use just uh, the most adverse result of the three analyses. The, um, these, uh, mo these motions should be compatible on average or individually, preferably, with the um, uh, design response spectrum. Um, and uh, there is a preference for uh, um, records which are either historic or modified historic or generated from simulation of the um, rupture, earthquake rupture on the fourth. Now, going now into design. There is a general statement of capacity uh, concerning capacity design. Capacity design uh, that statement refers not only to um, uh, seismic design, but to all undesirable failure modes um, that may cause progressive collapse. So it's a measure of, uh, it's a means to achieve robustness, capacity design. Capacity design essentially consists in defining certain hierarchies of strengths and failure modes and providing resistance against those failure modes not on the basis of analysis results, but on the basis of equilibrium and assuming that uh, certain uh, locations, certain plastic hinges will reach their resistance. Um, for example, if you don't want to have a failure of a, 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 a beam in, uh, of a column in shear, you assume that uh, um, it uh, uh, yields, the, the column reaches at the, uh, the yield uh, uh, moment at the top and the bottom, and then equilibrium of moments gives the shear along that uh, um, column. So it's, it's a shear that is physically defined as an upper limit that can be reached. If you design against that with a certain margin, shear failure in the column will not occur. So that's capacity design. And uh, in, a, in a case, in a rare case where the, Euro code, the, the model code is refers to specific structures, 
it um, gives uh, an indication of, uh, um, in, in frame systems of, of buildings, to uh, have a strong uh, um, uh, column weak beam um, design to provide a strong and stiff vertical spine um, through the columns that will not allow a, a storage way mechanism that may lead to collapse. Um, more details about analysis. Um, the, uh, with the exception of the um, uh, operational limit state, all the, in all other limit states, the uh, response will be strongly in the nonlinear range. So, in principle, we need to, to do a nonlinear analysis, so, which should be realistic. It should represent the model realistically, the distribution of st stiffness, strength, and resistance, uh, uh, resistance and mass in the structure. So uh, now, under certain conditions, instead of the nonlinear analysis, we can do a linear analysis to approximate the results. We will see that soon. Modeling is very important, not only for the representation of the, of the mass, but mainly for the representation of the stiffness. Because in, um, um, in um, displacement-based design, where we uh, do all the verifications by comparing earth, uh, seismic displacement, displacement or deformation demands to capacities, the capacities are fixed. We know them. If we underestimate the demands by assuming that the structure is, is stiffer, we are on the unsafe side. So we have to be realistic in the stiffness. And uh, if we make an error, it should be on the it should be safe-sided. And safe-sided in a displacement-based design means um, underestimation of stiffness, overestimation of flexibility, to, to, to come up with uh, not lower uh, displacements than expected. So uh, in, in force-based design, because the spectrum, uh, the, the acceleration spectrum has high values for stiff structures, low periods, we tend to underestimate, to overestimate the stiffness because that's conservative. We end up with higher forces. This is unconservative for displacement-based design. So the model code says that we should not miss sources of flexibility, not of stiffness. So um, tension stiffening, forget it. There is no stiffness. Everything is cracked. As a matter of fact, under cyclic loading, Cycling of, of the loading destroys a bond, so there is not much tension stiffening. We should also account um, the, for the flexibility due to partial pullout, slippage of, uh, of bars uh, from joints or footings, etc., which is something that happens in a region which we consider as rigid, but it adds to the flexibility of the member. For example, here at the bottom, if um, uh, the, uh, there is a certain slippage due to the strains that develop in the anchorage length of the bar in the joint, this uh, um, uh, shows up as a fixed end rotation of the beam or of the column, which adds to its flexibility. And we have to take that into account. The, the model code says that explicitly, and it gives also a relationship to calculate its value on the basis of simple assumptions, calibrated uh, uh, assumptions and expressions calibrated against test results. For example, this uh, formula there is theoretical. If you put there um, a mean uh, value of the, of the bond stress along the anchorage of the bar uh, equal to square root of Fc, which is not the strength, is a, a, a value that is derived from experimental results before yielding of the, of the uh, tensor reinforcement, then um, it, it, it gives good agreement with experimental results on the um, um, fixed end rotation to that purpose. Now, second point concerning stiffness. Um, 
Underlying uh, seismic codes is the assumption of bilinear behavior of elements, end of the structure. There is no cracking. The structure is taken um, linear elastic up to yielding, and then it is elastoplastic or uh, linearly strain hardening. So the, uh, the effective stiffness should represent the average stiffness to the yield point, the, to the corner of the um, uh, plastic uh, branch. And um, uh, so it, uh, it should be given, uh, if we assume uh, flexural behavior from a, a formula like this, which uh, if we have uh, this formula here, if we have purely flexural behavior, will give the familiar relationship that the stiffness is moment over curvature. Um, but it is here extended, this expression, to take into account, in, uh, in addition, shear deformations along what is called the shear span, which is the ratio of uh, moment to shear, and the fixed end rotation. So uh, the expression gives the effective stiffness as the ratio of the yield moment calculated from sectional analysis, the shear span, which is normally taken one half of the, of the member length, um, divided by three times the cord rotation at yielding. What is cord rotation? Cord rotation is the angle between the, uh, the tangent to the axis at the deformed position of the member and the cord connecting the two ends. It is a, it is a measure of, of deflection, not of rotation. It is deflection, let's say, at the tip of the cantilever divided by the, the height of the cantilever. Uh, and in, 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 in elastic analysis, if we know the, uh, the cord rotations at the two ends, we find the moments. So the model code gives the cord rotation at yielding, which enters the, the expression, as the sum of a flexural component, which is familiar, theoretical, in which we take into account the effect of the tension shift if there is diagonal cracking at 45 degrees before yielding of the member, this is the, um, the change uh, in, in the first um, point, uh, in the first bullet point. Um, at the end, we have to add uh, the fixed end rotation uh, due to the slippage of the bars from the anchorage zone. And there is a correction to take into account shear deformations, which is, depends on the type of element. This is completely empirical. So although this formula gives, uh, this, uh, uh, although this formula is, let's say, theoretical, with a yield moment computed from section analysis and the, and the cord rotation at yielding, again, semi-theoretical with only empirical correction, the prediction it gives against experimental results has considerable scatter, which uh, for, uh, is reflected in these figures for um, uh, beams, rectangular columns, or circular columns, that scatter is, um, um, rep, rep, uh, is equivalent to a coefficient variation of about 30%. For walls of various types and other non-rectangular members, like uh, uh, hollow rectangular sections, piers, hollow rectangular piers, uh, uh, T walls, uh, um, L walls, uh, uh, H section walls, etc., it gives higher um, uh, scatter uh, amounting to a coefficient variation of 40%. But the bias is not much. So this expression um, is, is uh, um, good enough for estimation of the um, effective stiffness to, uh, to, to, to the yield point. Now, there is a, a catch there, though, that to uh, apply this expression, you need to know the reinforcement. So it's good for assessment of existing structures it not, it's not so convenient for design. I will come back later on this, on how we buy, bypass this problem. There are empirical formulas which are not given in the model code, but they are mentioned. Their existence is mentioned. And there are ways to bypass this, but it may require iterations. Now, 
So in principle, analysis should be nonlinear and should use as elastic stiffness that effective stiffness to the yield point. But under certain conditions, we can estimate displacements, be, be it uh, nonlinear displacement, in in strongly inelastic displacements, with linear an analysis. Because the so-called equal displacement rule applies in good approximation for concrete structures. Concrete structures have, if we, one calculates realistically their natural periods, have natural periods in the constant spectral velocity branch of the spectrum or in the constant uh, spectral displacement branch where the equal displacement rule applies well. What does the equal displacement rule say? It says that if you know the, the period, you can calculate the displacements as, as though the structure is remained elastic. They, they are more or less the same. More or less means 5 to 10% difference on average. So one can do a linear analysis to calculate displacements and deformations, not forces. However, to do that, the, displa the displacement deformations they must have to be uniformly distributed, not concentrated in a certain story, in a certain side of the building, in certain piers of the bridge. So one has to check whether one has to, uh, can do a linear analysis, check if the displacement, the deformation demands will be uniformly distributed, more or less uniformly. The Euro code gives for the, to that end a range um, of non-uniformity between one, uh, one and three. Um, not the magnitude, the magnitude of the deformations compared to the yield deformation. And if they are within that range, you can assume that you can use a linear elastic analysis with a 5% um, dumped spectrum without reduction factor, without an R factor uh, to reduce the spectrum to estimate the displacement deformations. Now, uh, detailed uh, rules are given like in every co code in the, in the model code for how, how you can do a linear, a linear elastic analysis. Normally a model response spectrum analysis with the combination of modes, uh, etc. I will not get into detail in this. The, the model code is self-sufficient on this point. Um, and it also gives uh, rules in, uh, according to which this linear uh, model response spectrum analysis can be simplified into equivalent static with lateral forces. And it, it, speci it, it uh, specializes these simplification rules for buildings or for bridges in, in general terms, but um, specific enough to be applied for at least these two type of uh, ma main two types of structures, buildings and bridges. Um, so I will not, I will bypass this part. Uh, all the details are given in the model code. Now, if you do a linear analysis, um, you have to combine a linear um, uh, analysis with a response spectrum or equivalent, equivalent static, you get the peak, for, the peak um, deformation demands. You have to combine these peak values due to the different components. They, the components take place simultaneously, but their peak values not. The peak values of the response due to each component, they don't take place simultaneously. Um, there is a, a rigorous rule, the SRSS rule, to combine these peak values of, uh, due to the different components. And that's the only one which is um, allowed in the model code. National codes, including the Euro code, have approximations to this uh, um, rule in the sense that having, uh, of allowing to take 100% of one component 30% of the other and 30% of the vertical. This is not mentioned because it's, it, uh, computationally it is easy, as easy to do the SRSS as the linear approximation. Maybe it is even easier and it's more rigorous and gives results independent of the choice of the horizontal or the directions of the horizontal components. Now, this, all this goes for linear analysis. For nonlinear, you 
apply the components simultaneously in the two horizontal directions. And in the vertical, if you want to take into account the, the vertical, which is all, not always necessary. If you do a linear analysis, the, uh, the displacement deformation demands that you calculate are credible, they are about accurate. The force demands are garbage. They, the force demands that you get from a linear analysis uh, ex exceed by several times the magnitude of, you, of the resistance of a reason, or a reasonable uh, value of the resistance. So you need to, to go either through the nonlinear moment rotation um, loss at the ends of the member to calculate from the inelastic displacements that you calculated approximately as elastic the moments, and then from the moments find the, the, the shears through equilibrium, or do capacity design. Capacity design is from the, from the uh, outset to, to assume that uh, plastic hinges develop at, uh, at the ends of the members and calculate with equilibrium the forces. And a, a, a very a full portfolio of uh, uh, expressions and rules for capacity design of any type of member is given in the Euro code, uh, in the model code, um, which are extension of the ones in the Euro code um, for buildings or bridges. And these uh, refer to uh, vertical elements, columns, bridge uh, piers, uh, or similar, um, where it is taken into account, not, uh, where the expressions take into account the possibility that the plastic hinges will not form in the member itself, but in the ones that uh, uh, it is connected to. The same for uh, beams, horizontal members, that is members which have, take also gravity load. The same for beam column joints which develop very high shear stresses, very um, extensive coverage of that. And by joints in this respect, it is not meant in the, in the model code only beam column joints. Pier deck joints in bridges are also covered by this rule to calculate the uh, shear stresses in the joint. Um, there are also um, uh, rules to calculate um, uh, forces in uh, components which you want to keep elastic during the response, like a bridge deck uh, or some other sensitive components. There are rules uh, fully operational there. There are rules to calculate the shear forces up the height of a wall, taking into account um, the magnification of these uh, shear forces after plastic hinging at the base of the, of the um, uh, wall due to higher modes which continue um, operating on the rest of the structure uh, after plastic hinging uh, of the wall. There are rules for the calculation of uh, capacity design effects for the foundation and the ground and foundation elements, um, which have as their basis the corresponding rules of the Euro code, but they are far more extended and much more, much more general. So a full portfolio of rules. There are also uh, gu there is also guidance uh, uh, concerning the um, uh, how you you carry out a nonlinear analysis uh, about the models. Um, it says that uh, uh, what, is, what should be preserved by nonlinear models is the elastic stiffness as been defined before, as second to the yield point. It allows uh, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, say, the envelope of uh, the uh, force displacement response to be considered as elastic perfectly plastic with uh, no degradation of resistance as a simplification. Um, and uh, it also says that uh, in, um, uh, for uh, nonlinear dynamic analysis in which you need a hysteresis law uh, relating uh, moment uh, with, to rotation, for example, uh, you can use simplifications with uh, piecewise linear uh, laws, uh, which uh, may take or may not uh, uh, into account resistance, degradation of resistance. They may or may not take into account pinching due to slippage and shear effects, etc. So, analysis could be relatively simple, be it nonlinear. What is most important 
I repeat, is how you, uh, what value you choose for the, uh, uh, the, the stiffness, the elastic stiffness, which should be the secant to the yield point. Now, so this is the part on the seismic demands for the formations. These demands are compared to certain capacities. And the rest of my presentation concerning the model code it, uh, refers to the capacities. Um, in seismic loading, um, members fail due to deformations, but not due to strains. A strain is a, is a deformation. But um, a member will not fail because a bar yielded or even ruptured. It will not fail because a bar buckled or because concrete crushed locally. It will fail because a whole region of a member has disintegrated and lost a good part of its resistance. So uh, verifications in terms of the formations and in terms of rotations and members' ends, plastic hinge rotations, which capture the behavior of a region. So the ultimate uh, deformation is defined in terms of rotations, plastic hinge rotations or plastic part of the cord rotation. It's the same thing, essentially. In which, though, one has to lump the, uh, uh, the part, the nonlinear part of the fixed end rotation due to slippage of the bars from the air anchor zone. And we have to define conventionally what ultimate deformation means. Sometimes members may lose resistance due to cyclic loading rapidly and abruptly. Sometimes, as in uh, the, the left one of these two figures, the resistance uh, decreases smoothly. And you cannot say where exactly the member failed. So conventionally, we identify failure as a, a point where we lost 20% of the lateral force resistance. Lateral force, not gravity load resistance. Why 20%? It's conventional. 10% is negligible. 30% is too much. It's conventional. So when we talk about ultimate, we mean drop in lateral force resistance by 20%. It's not a disaster. The member does not collapse. It still retains its gravity load. And um, we uh, calculate this, um, this capacity uh, through some formulas, through some models, which give the mean value. But the models have very large scatter. So we base uh, the uh, verifications on 5% uh, uh, characteristic values, lower, lower, um, um, uh, uh, lower uh, fractile of the, of the um, ultimate deformation, and we uh, get that from the mean value by dividing by a, a model-dependent uh, gamma factor, which um, reflects model uncertainty. Now, on top of that, we apply a safety factor in the end, depending on the limit state. No safety factor for the near collapse limit state, um, 1.35 safety factor for the uh, life safety. Concerning the models, there is, let's say, a physical model, a, more, uh, um, a, a model which gives the impression that it's based on first principles, which says that the plastic hinge develops in it um, uniform um, curvatures. And it fails when those uniform curvatures in the plastic hinge reach the um, ultimate curvature. So at that point, the rotation of the plastic hinge is equal to the difference between the, the ultimate and the yield curvature denoted by u and y times the plastic hinge length. And it's, it's translated into a chord rotation by multiplying by this uh, second uh, uh, factor in parentheses. And we have also to add the additional uh, co um, uh, fixed end rotation due to slippage. And if you calculate on the basis of section analysis, these um, curvatures, and you use strain limits for failure, which are 
um, fitted to test results. These are the strain limits which give good, uh, good approximation for, uh, to test results under cyclic loading for curvature on the basis of uh, numerous measurements of curvature at failure of comic rim members. Uh, just 3 eighths of 37.5% uh, uh, is 3 eighths of the nominal elongation of steel. Why so little? Because the, the steel bars buckle under cyclic loading, and once they buckle, they break easier in the next cycle. And um, for the concrete, the confined concrete, the conventional 0.35% uh, plus a factor which depends on confinement, um, and uh, it depends on the effectiveness of confinement ratio, the alpha there, which is given for different types of sections, and the amount of confining reinforcement. And if you assume this, if you make these assumptions which are calibrated to measurements of curvature at failure, and in addition, on the basis of other calibrations of the uh, fixed end rotation due to yield penetration in the anchorage zone between yielding and ultimate, given by this expression at the top, 5.5 times the bar diameter yield penetration length, then the expressions that give good average uh, fit to test results on failure are given at the end. Um, they are different only for circular columns. For beams, columns, or walls, or other members, they are covered by a single expression. And that's the amount of uh, scatter that these expressions give. For circular columns, the scatter is not too bad. It corresponds to a coefficient variation of 30%. For beams and columns and walls, a very large number of tests, the coefficient variation is large, 45, 45%. So the scatter is large, which gives, in the end, a necessary, uh, la a necessarily large uh, um, gamma RD model uncertainty factor. So these are the, uh, however, because these are physical um, uh, based models uh, on the basis of that very attractive plastic hinge model, these are given higher priority in the model code. But the model code on the left hand side mentions also only for um, re rectangular columns, beams, walls, or elements which consist of rectangular parts, these empirical expressions, because they give better uh, accuracy, um, which uh, uh, reflect uh, the axial load level, the reinforcement, uh, uh, tensional compression reinforcement, uh, the shear span, the confinement, even diagonal reinforcement that we may place the, to increase the ductility in a, a seemingly complex but computationally efficient way. It's a single formula. So, and they give better agreement with the test results, still lots of scatter, which corresponds to coefficient variation reduced from 45% to 38%. Um, and, uh, uh, but they are more operational and overall more accurate than the physical based ones. And to finish the uh, review of the verifications for the uh, because this, what we were talking about so far, were for the ultimate limit stage, for the serviceability, as I said before, yielding or exceedance by a factor of two. Now, this sounds complex for practical application, and it is more complex than usual uh, uh, design practice. Um, so, in, in, to close, I will show you um, a procedure that can be followed, of course more complex than what we are doing now, that can lead to uh, design of new structures, um, and indeed, as I will show you to, with, in a certain example, to cost savings in uh, amount of steel at least. So, these are the basic, be, be, uh, behind this step-by-step -step procedure that I will describe to you shortly, um, there are these concepts. First, a, a structure has to resist non-seismic loads. 
and satisfy the ultimate limit state and serviceability limit states for all uh, other types of uh, actions. So that's where the design should start. And, this, and seismic design will fall, should follow. Second, um, we should try to avoid doing nonlinear dynamic analysis. Uh, we cannot expect from a practicing engineer to do anything more than a linear elastic analysis for seismic design. To achieve that, uh, the conceptual design and the detailed design should make sure that the uh, inelastic deformations will be fairly, fairly uniformly distributed in the structure so that linear methods can be applied. And we should uh, uh, try to do that, to achieve this, non, uh, uh, this fairly uniform uh, distribution of deformations from the outset. Third, um, la last law. Um, we forget about prescriptive detailing rules. Deta detailing, uh, say, amount of stirrups for confinement. Um, and uh, relative distribution of the uh, layout of the um, uh, reinforcement in the section and other aspects are determined from the verifications of inelastic deformations. So this replaces the prescriptive detailing rules. There are no prescriptive detailing rules in this part of the model code. Uh, pre prescriptive detailing rules have no place in a performance-based code. So. Steps in the procedure. We should try to have uniform member sections in the same family of, se of members. Walls should have the same or similar lengths. Piers should have not only the same um, section, but also similar uh, effective lengths. Uh, beam depths should be constant in a given frame. If we um, follow that rule, in the end, the deformations will be uniformly distributed, the, the inelastic deformations will be uniformly distributed within the same family of members at least, which is, that, which is the important aspect. Second, we do dimensioning for ultimate limit state and serviceability limit state for all non-seismic actions. And we arrive at a certain amount of reinforcement, including minimum measures for, that, uh, for those actions. If we are talking about the building, we make sure that the columns are stronger uh, than the beams in frames to avoid soft story mechanisms. Four, we estimate the effective stiffness to the yield point. We, we can do that on the basis of the reinforcement we calculated for non-seismic loads. But if we expect that the reinforcement may be more, we can increase it appropriately to calculate the stiffness. And in addition, we can use um, uh, empirical expressions like this one, which gives, uh, which is completely dependent on the amount of reinforcement. It, it depends on the, the cross-section, on the geometry of the member and the uh, level of the axial load and the type of member, and gives, um, on average, good uh, estimations. Then we start the, linear, the, the uh, seismic design. First, with a serviceability limit state, either operational or immediate use, for, for which we do a linear elastic analysis using those secant stiffness to the yield point. And we calculate. Elastic moment demands, which are fictitious because we may have exceeded yielding, and the corresponding capacities according to the reinforcement that we have already. And we find their ratio. Now, we may increase the reinforcement so that that ratio of the demand to capacity at the plastic hinges is uniform within the same family of members and close to the target of one for the operational limit state, or two for the immediate use. Close, not below. If we have certain sections which are over-reinforced due to gravity loads or wind loading, 
And under the serviceability earthquake, they exhaust 40% of their, let's say, resi moment resistance, while others well exceeded, necessarily, in the ultimate limit state, these sections will have different uh, deformation demands. And we will not be allowed to, to use throughout a linear elastic analysis, and the performance will be bad. So if we have such differences, what we can do is we can increase the reinforcement in all other sections by raising the level of the immediate use or the operational um, uh, limit state earthquake. Now, once we do that, we do some iterations so that we have consistency of the stiffness values we used with the reinforcement that we placed after that step. And uh, uh, normally, one iteration suffices. And then we proceed with the uh, analysis for the immediate, uh, for the linear, uh, I'm sorry, for the uh, life safety or the near collapse earthquake, which can still be linear if we have achieved this rule of uniform deformation demands in the serviceability limit stage. And from that uh, linear analysis, we calculate um, inelastic deformation demands, plastic hinge rotations. And we compare those two capacities. And if they are not, the capacities are not uh, sufficient, we increase the capa deformation capacity. How? By increasing the amount confining reinforcement, by changing the layout of reinforcement, uh, reducing uh, the reinforcement which is in between the tensor and the compression cords, and increasing the reinforcement at the tensor and the compression cords. Because the, the key thing that controls the formation capacity is the compression reinforcement. If you can achieve uh, the same uh, uh, moment resistance, let's say, with the uh, with a more uh, with uh, by placing more reinforcement in the, uh, the tensor and compression cord and less reinforcement distributed in the web, this is in favor of the formation capacity. Um, so, in general, there are means through these uh, deformation capacity expressions which easily point in the direction of how you can increase the capacity without redoing an analysis, because the, the capacity, the formation capacity normally does not affect the stiffness. It, it refers to the confining reinforcement. Uh, it refers to the distribution of the reinforcement in the section, possibly, um, but not so much to the stiffness. And there, the, the, the design ends unless, uh, well, it ends after doing capacity design to, 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 to uh, provide resistance uh, against shear for um, the seismic um, design. And if uh, the deformation demands ha um, have been um, uniform, more fairly uniform, not fully uniform, then an, an evaluation through nonlinear analysis is not required. But if we have a very irregular structure, a very irregular distribution of overstrengths, then the penalty is that in the end we have to do a nonlinear analysis to verify that the, we, um, the design is safe. And um, this approach, um, with differences in the coefficients, but the same um, overall approach, uh, has been applied in, um, for the design of some bridges uh, for not real, well, they, they are variations of real bridges, um, but they are fictitious for um, uh, demonstration of how this works. Um, and uh, there are three variations of a real um, um, bridge, uh, which is uh, at the top under A there. It's a can balanced cantilever bridge. Um, and the other two variations is one that is made longer uh, but with more or less un uh, uh, uniform um, peer uh, heights. And the other is with completely non-uniform peer heights in which uh, the peers uh, were um, in the top 30 meters were um, uh, had a twin blade section uh, to have uh, more or less the same stiffness in their uh, more flexible part. Um, so, and the other type of uh, bridge uh, is uh, variations of the, um, um, of the one shown at the top, 
with uh, having uh, having taller uh, peers or more uh, spans uh, with or without taller peers and also non-uniform peer heights uh, again with uh, uh, the top 30 meters um, made with the same type of section to have uniform flexibility and I will just show you the final outcome in terms of amount of steel in the piers. The deck in all cases was the same. The, the sizes of the piers, the dimensions of the piers were the same. What changed was the amount of reinforcement necessary. In a Eurocode ATW of design, which has prescriptive minimum rules for reinforcement, and in a design which is along the lines I, I uh, described, um, uh, and um, what you see, apart from the amount of steel, total amount of steel in the piers, is the peak ground acceleration under which the various designs reached um, a, a margin of safety of two against flexural deform exceedance of flexural deformations anywhere, or a margin of safety of 1.25 on shear strength anywhere in the bridge. So as far as the, uh, let's say, um, safety of these designs are concerned, they are more or less equivalent because the peak and accelerations um, in the, the two type of designs are more or less the same. In some cases, the Eurocode A design is um, high, higher uh, PGA. In other cases, the model code design has higher, P, higher PGA. But the key thing is that the amount of steel required for that is much lower. Why is that? Because the, there are no prescriptive minimum reinforcement rules imposed in this case. Um, in other words, uh, even the Euro code, uh, which is a relatively recent code, uh, puts indiscriminately uh, minimum reinforcement even where it is not needed. Um, in a performance-based approach, especially when it is based on deformations, you put the reinforcement where you need it. And that's where you can have uh, um, cost savings. Okay? So um, this is um, the, the, the lesson, at least, uh, for, that one gets from uh, um, this application. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Questions or comments, please. About the example which you have solved here, using the linear elastic analysis, uh, it necessarily implies a use of a response reduction factor. Uh, no. Can you tell us? No? No. no. One. But the code response reduction factor is one. But that's not what the code says. All the earthquake codes. While when they are asking you to use a linear method instead of a non-linear plastic, they are recommending a response reduction factor. Not a, for the first time, not model code 2010. Oh, oh, oh that's the. This is uh, the groundbreaking uh, aspect of it. Wonderful. The, there is no reduction factor when you calculate displacements and deformations. I see. So you use the elastic spectrum unreduced, 5% damping. Second case is, sir, that if you are going to use the capacity protection concept at the junction bottom of the pier and the foundation, the foundation itself could be a pile cap and quite long piles in case of river, river uh, piles. And reality, in reality, that means the fixity comes at the ground level, not on the top of the pile cap, uh, in which case, how does this concept of uh, capacity production can work? Well, um, you said uh, seismic protection. You, you, you mentioned the term protection. You see, what we do is uh, uh, when we have got uh, such a situations of uh, foundations, uh, to reduce the cost of foundation, we d decide to introduce, allow, allow the hinges to form on top of the foundation level, at, maybe at pile cap level. When that happens, then you don't have to design the foundation for a 
response uh, reduction factor of one as per the existing code, whereas the peer could be designed with a response redu reduction factor of 2.5. Now, having allowed to formation of a hinge artificially at a lower value of the bending moment than what you would get by a simple analysis, uh, then we say that, look, the hinge will form there, so more force cannot go downstairs. It, it can't be more than that. And that means the foundation cost reduces by that particular method. Now, this is what we have been doing so far. But now, if you're not using response reduction factor, then uh, what do you do? <laughs> it's a matter of uh, uh, you will get used to it. <laughs> I, th <laughs> I think so, but I like yeah, the method. But, uh, I like the method if you are not, because well, I have got a lot of, let, let, lot let of me, objections. Let me, let me tell you, well, uh, first of all, I, 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 when you said uh, uh, protection, I thought that you were talking about, because uh, by uh, size protection systems, normally we, we mean um, base isolation. You did not mean that, no. Okay, base isolation with, is not within the scope of model code, but concerning the, the, uh, the design of the foundations. The, um, as in the most codes, uh, the model code assumes that the plastic hinges will form in places where it will be ac accessible and uh, possibly and easy to repair, to inspect and repair. So it does not go as far as the Eurocode 8, which allows hinges in the piles. Here, it does not mention anything in the piles, but it says that the foundations and the foundation uh, and the ground should be uh, uh, capacity designed on the basis of a plastic hinge developing at the base of the vertical element, possibly a bridge pier, so that the foundation system, including the piles, will stay elastic. Now, if you want to allow uh, plastic hinging in the piles, then you should do uh, a nonlinear analysis, including soil structure interaction with uh, uh, the corresponding springs uh, with their big Y curves, and uh, uh, check the, 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 uh, the piles for their deformation capacities. The formulas for deformation capacities apply to piles as well. But uh, the model code does not get into such details. It's not so specific. Now, exactly what you said just now we are doing, we are applying this, uh, we are doing the soil structure interaction to just to find out whether the plastic hinges are forming first in the pile, cap, pile, pile or in the, at the top of the pier, wherever it is forming first, we are providing the ductile detailing as per the present code. My question is different now, but coming back to your presentation, the S, in the SRSS, the SRSS method, your peak deformation in all three peak deformation in all three direction you are taking, unlike in other quotes, isn't it very severe? It isn't it very very uh, no, severe? No, no, it is. It is written in a general form. It's, yeah. uh, the, 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 the model code says <coughs> maybe I have um, I have said that somewhere. Um, well, it says specifically where the vertical direction, the vertical component should be taken into account. How much percent, 50%? No, that, uh, normally it is. No, uh, how much is defined by the response spectrum in the vertical direction? That's up to national authorities to define. It's an issue beyond the model code. Um, somewhere, maybe even in this presentation, but for sure in the model code, it says suggested cases when taking the vertical uh, component to account is, uh, let's, is required. But normally the vertical is not taken into account. <coughs> Another last uh, one query. I downloaded this model code, but I'm not finding a seismic design. It is, seismic design is covered in the model code? Is what? The seismic design. Seismic. Seismic design, yes. what you're yes. talking about. Yes. I could not see in the model code. Oh, it's scattered. Uh, it's covered. Uh, section 7.74, uh, most of seven, section 7.4 is seismic design. And the action uh, and the analysis procedures are um, in um, uh, 
in uh, chapter uh, five, I think. So the definition of the performance uh, uh, levels, the limit states, is in the general part. The representative actions are there. So the actions are elsewhere, the, perform the limit states are elsewhere. 7.4 is where the design rules come. Uh, what I understand from your presentation is that basically the model code has given only philosophically, in very generic terms, what approach should be followed. And you have given some four performance levels, and you have defined what those performance levels are. And you expect that the code makers in respective countries, depending upon the complexity they can handle, will formulate a code, you know, keeping these in mind. Now, uh, and I understand that for building or bridge, both the basic philosophy is same. My question is that, you know, in this four performance level which you have mentioned, one is the operational, immediate use, life safety, and near collapse. Is it really, uh, these terminologies are really, is it really applicable for bridges? Because life safety is, a, is an issue which is actually concerns building. As far as bridges are concerned, the, probably a better term could be more appropriate, number one. Second, whether those performance level which you have mentioned, the, because the design life for building would be slightly different from the design life expected for bridges, how these are covered in the, in the model code? Yes, these are, these are aspects which are not within the scope of the, Euro code, of the model code. By the way, concerning life, terminology life safety. In, in the Euro codes, the, the term life safety is also used, at least in, uh, in Euro code 8, for bridges as well. Uh, it is uh, supposedly when, uh, uh, because for bridges, the, the, uh, the damage is concentrated in piers. If the piers um, uh, fail and fall, the deck will fall and there will be a life safety problem. Uh, uh, but may, maybe you are absolutely right in uh, uh, that some uh, uh, refinement of the terms for, uh, for, uh, uh, for um, bridges is, uh, is, uh, is, is due. Um, the only, uh, well, the terminology for performance levels has been introduced uh, in the um, United States in uh, the mid-90s through the Vision 2000 document. And there, which referred only to buildings. And there they introduced operational, uh, immediate occupancy, life safety, and uh, non-collapse or near collapse. The only change here is that um, the term immediate occupancy was changed to immediate use to cover the bridges. So, but the terminology is somehow tailored to buildings. You are right. Now, um, concerning the performance levels, these uh, are up to the national authorities or regional authorities to define through the definition of the hazard level. The, the hazard levels that were, let's say, shown here and included in the model code, they are specifically mentioned to be only for ordinary structures. And uh, an overpass may be considered an ordinary structure, but a more important bridge is not an ordinary structure with a longer uh, uh, service life. So, it, but also you were absolutely right saying that the model code not only this part, but in all other aspect, aspects, gives general rules to be used uh, possibly a la carte by national uh, uh, codes, original codes. And essentially, it's po it points, what, uh, as far as seismic design is concerned, the main objective is to point to a direction, performance-based, displacement-based, use of uh, uh, second to yield point stiffness to estimate well the displacements. These are the main points. Um, and, uh, and it gives some other tools to be operational for relatively clean and simple cases. It's not a full seismic code at all. Thank you. In the last slide, you have shown that the different, some comparisons, the displacement approach and the other approach, the, the approach which we generally do now. 
Yes. 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 Well, it depends. Um, in here, when I say Eurocode date, um, it uh, uses a minimum reinforcement of 1% in the peers throughout the height, which is a lot. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Eurocode date defines 1% as minimum reinforcement for columns in buildings. It does not set a clear limit, lower li uh, minimum, for bridge piers. But um, um, so people could use the 0.2% of Eurocode 2 part 2. And that's what is essentially considered, essentially, and, uh, and uh, respected in the last uh, column. The first uh, column, the, the third column for the Eurocode design has the 1% and also it has the prescriptive rules on um, density and amount of, of stirrups. In some cases, uh, as you pointed out rightly, the difference is large. Uh, the extreme case is this 15 to 5, it's one third. In other cases, uh, the difference is just 20%. Uh, it depends on the case, uh, especially when, um, well, uh, but it, because the only variable between those designs were the, the height and shape of the piers, uh, that made a big difference. Where 1% uh, is, at least in these designs, was used as the, as the minimum, as it is normally done in, in practice. Just uh, one quick uh, question. Uh, we use a nonlinear static pushover analysis typically uh, in the American framework, in the FEMA and the SOAC and all those documents. We use a nonlinear static pushover. Here, we, I don't see how we are integrating. We're taking it away, right? Absolutely. But we still use the four along the, the pushover curve. We still use those same. Well, let me tell you, the Americans essentially are abandoning pushover. Uh, the, uh, the pushover is, is all essentially disappearing from American practice, especially concerning tall buildings. They are using nonlinear dynamic. And um, the, uh, the pushover is not a general method. It's a method based on the first mode, which works uh, well, when you have first mode controlled structures. If you start having significant torsion or significant higher mode effects, then uh, there are variations of the pushover which can correct some of its uh, uh, shortcomings, but it loses uh, very seriously in its simplicity. So um, since we are seeing this trend in the United States, where the nonlinear analysis has started, away from pushover, and since pushover is an approach which is not based, let's say, on textbook material, uh, like linear uh, dynamic analysis or even nonlinear dynamic analysis, and it has to be supplemented with additional rules in the code, it was left out. I think that as a code that points to the future and which had a serious, uh, serious limits in the length that it could take in the, in the model code, which is not a seismic code, it had no place. Okay? 
uh, it's not that uh, it is rejected completely. It is, it is not mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, two comments. Uh, one is related to the minimum reinforcement. Actually, the different countries uh, at the level of a national or regional could impose a very high percentage, which is 1%. This is a mistake because uh, high percentage uh, implies very often uh, irregularities in the behavior of the single peers. That is, when the ratio between required reinforcement and actual reinforcement is very different from one, uh, this is a problem. This changes the behavior of the child. And then uh, it is uh, correct to put a reinforcement very low, very near to the required reinforcement by the analysis. The second uh, relates to the head of the piles, to the top of the piles. In my opinion, uh, we design also to avoid the plastic changes, but the head of the piles ignored the model code, uh, and I'm sure that with uh, piles in a big plant, uh, I don't know, a plant of uh, a pier uh, to bring a, a bridge of 100 meters of span is 15 by 15 meters, you know, the plant with a depth of three meters. You have under that piles of 1.2, 1.5 meters, you will have uh, plastic inches. And there, there is a double mistake in several codes. 1% of longitudinal reinforcement, which is too much. No requirements generally for the transverse reinforcement. The solution should be the opposite, to reduce the reinforcement at the minimum there and to confine a lot so that we cannot avoid the plastic inch formation, well, we will have for the future one inch there, and then we don't take into account the resistance at the moment transmitted in that region. But it's important to confine a lot to that region. Maybe a small one. You mentioned about uh, uh, displacement-based uh, design and force-based design. And you said in the displacement-based design, if the deflections are more, then the earthquake force attracted by the structure is more. I am not able to comprehend that. Can you please explain, or maybe I missed out something? Can you repeat? Uh, uh, Force-based design, yes. what we are used to, when we have rigid structure, we get larger force. Flexible structure attracts lesser seismic force. In the displacement-based design, you said the reverse. Well, is that so? Yes. Uh, le le if I understood correctly, let me uh, explain what I meant. Uh, okay, what I meant is the following. In force-based design, we use the acceleration spectrum. And we find the spectral acceleration, and we multiply my mass, translate it into force, we apply the force. The shorter the period, the larger the acceleration, the larger the force. And normally, we try to, to be on the, to err on the safe side, that is, to get periods which correspond to the acceleration plateau. Now, if we convert this spectrum into a displacement spectrum, it starts from zero, it goes parabolically for the, uh, the acceleration plateau. And then in the, in the velocity plateau, in the falling branch, it goes up linearly. And then it is constant. So displacements increase with the period. If we underestimate the period, as we do now, using, let's say, in the Euro code and the American code, 50% of the uncrashed stiffness. But the real stiffness is 25% of the uncracked stiffness. We underestimate the displacement by uh, between 40% uh, and, and possibly 100%. So, uh, and it is unsafe. We may be checking displacements which are well below the real ones. Right, thank you. Okay. That's not within the model code uh, because seating length is, uh, yes, yes, you, it, it, for, for um, seating length uh, um, and et cetera and uh, uh, joints uh, in bridges, 
displacements are important. But again, it's, uh, it has n that it's not specific to concrete, so it's not covered there. So please join to me too. Thank you. <laughs>